David Bowie, cultural icon, musical superstar, and widely respected pop chameleon, has changed genre and identity more times than any of his contemporaries. Yet to fully appreciate this remarkable career, we have to look back at his earlier years and the albums that helped pave the way for things to come. Space Oddity, The Man Who Sold the World, and Hunky Dory. 200 years, if you look back, you'll know the name David Bowie, you'll know the Beatles, you'll know Bob Dylan, and most of the other bands you won't know. He was trying things, he was looking here, he was looking there, he was looking at mine, looking at theatre, looking at songwriting, looking at image. There's so many different things that it's a very tricky path to do, and you know, who else has done what he's done? There is a mystique about him, that, and people expect him to be quite mysterious. I don't think he is. I think he's just like me and you. But people see him as something special. He thinks he can walk on water, he thinks he can do anything, he thinks he can create one of the best records ever made, and he's just about done it. This film is a review of those albums, the music Bowie made, and the way he changed popular culture forever. In the late 1960s, David Bowie was virtually unrecognisable from the influential and globally renowned artist he would eventually become. David had come out of the late 60s, although we associate him, first of all, with having success, you know, well, seven, as a 70s person, 70s success, he had his origins, obviously, in the late 60s, and, you know, being, being David Jones in the lower third, and it was only really when he became David Bowie that it really happened and he, you felt this persona growing, this real sense of an artist, as somebody who was uh, creating, creating a persona for himself. In my limited experience, people only tell you that they saw genius blossoming uh, after the genius has blossomed uh, and uh, with the gift of hindsight. So I, I would love to be able to say, yes, as soon as he walked into the room, I detected something magical about David Bowie and time has proven me right, but that would be complete bollocks, frankly, and I think anybody who tells you that is probably lying. It was a period of struggle, both for exposure and recognition, during which Bowie would align himself with such bands as the Manish Boys, the Lower Third and the Buzz. Connections and friends from these days would prove instrumental in the recording of Bowie's eventual solo hits. I did, in those days, used to read The Melody Maker and The New Musical Express now. The NME had a, a section at the back where they would uh, advertise Johnny Kidd and the Pirates, maybe some other bands, and certainly there was an ad in the back of there which were David Jones and the Lower Third, and I'd noticed that one. Didn't mean anything, but it was a band that was willing to pay for the advertising space. The Marquee Club in Wardour Street, I'd heard of it, so I walked in. There was one guy there, Jack Barry, the manager, I asked him if anybody was looking for a guitarist and he gave me a phone number and I auditioned the following Saturday and I met David. He's always had a good ear for musicians and a good eye for collaborators um, and uh, he's always surrounded himself with very useful people and if they're not useful then they don't last long. Uh, so the, you know, top level people like Tony Visconti, Brian Eno, Carlos Alomar, these people recur throughout his career. Uh, other people seem to drift in for one album and are not used again. Uh, often they can be perfect sort of horses for courses for that particular venture. Um, but it's, uh, it's a real mark of quality if you're ask, asked back for a second, second time with Bowie. It was during these early years that Bowie also developed a knack for self-promotion. David was always up to some scheme to hit the public eye. And it was his idea to come up with this uh, notion that um, he would form a society for the preservation of animal filament, it was called, which was long hair. Well, long hair in those days wasn't so long as you imagined. I mean, I've probably got long hair now to a 60s person. And uh, anyway, he came up with this scheme and he got several people, famous people, to sponsor it. And we all had longish hair, you know, to back him up. 
and um, it made a lot of newspapers, virtually all the newspapers ran the story, um, and then it ended up on television with the Cliff Mishamore um, Tonight programme, I think it was. Well, I think we're all fairly tolerant, but for the last two years we've had uh, comments like, darling, and uh, can I carry a handbag thrown at us? I think it's just had to stop now. You can see that somebody there that is desperate for the kind of attention, being a pop star, but doesn't at that point seem to quite know how to go about getting it. It was anything to get, get known and get noticed. And that's what it was about, really, in those days. You had no managers, really, who were going to do big things. You had no accountants. It was not a lawyer-based, accountant-based business then. You just had yourself, your, your, the clothes you stood up in. In actual fact, you were probably be on stage in the clothes you walked in the street in um, because no one had any money there's no money in it really until, until you had a hit record and even then there was not much money in it really with this early period of self-development coming to an end Bowie did the inevitable and branched out as a solo artist his first album a self-titled debut with heavy folk overtones was released in 1967 to this day, it remains a remarkable, if somewhat quaint, curiosity piece. Rubber band, there's a rubber band that plays tunes out of tune In the library garden Sunday afternoon While a little chappy waves a golden wand Rubber band That was very twee. It was 1967, and he'd come out of like the R&B scene in London, the Marquee Club, and all that. And um, he became a troubadour. You know, he was very influenced by Dylan and a very acoustic guitar-y, You know, and right up until Hunky Dory. I mean, the early stuff was novelty, typical 1967 orchestral tootling kind of back backings. I can remember him as a 12-string strummer of the acoustic guitar, and as a writer of not very good songs. Um, and he was the resident at the Three Tons in Beckenham, round about 1969. He was influenced by Anthony Newley. And I know, I think, what influenced him was not the kind of all singing, all dancing, musical West End Anthony Newley, but There'd been a very peculiar TV series he'd been in, which was a very avant-garde thing. I'm convinced that that is also what sort of partly set David Bowie on his avant-garde path. I was quite satisfied with the way things were going. I mean, I hadn't find, found any voice style and I hadn't found any way to perform. I was sort of very much in the Tony Newley thing. Um, mainly because I came from London and it seemed more natural. It was sort of a combination of Sid Barrett and Tony Newley. Um, who were both, I thought, uh, A1 sort of English artists in their own sort of things. I got quickly uh, fed up with Newley because it, it he didn't come up with anything else. He never went far enough. Uh, he sort of stumbled around on the um, Broadway show thing. He got into that syndrome. And Sid, of course, got a bit lost up there in Cambridge. The thing is, in Britain in the, in the late 60s, uh, it was overrun with sort of slightly posh young men with slightly eccentric hair and, and big guitars trying to sound winsome and sensitive. Donovan was merely the tip of a large and fearful iceberg of which David Bowie was at that time a very small part. The music he was making at that point, if he hadn't later become who he became, I don't think uh, anybody would have been... Not only would nobody be interested in it now, I don't think anybody would have been terribly interested in it by about 1970. Barry's first album didn't quite prove to be the runaway success he had hoped for. His solo career was looking increasingly precarious. Such desperate times meant, as well as taking up a part-time job in a printing firm, Barry was also reduced to appearing in television commercials. I think he could have, from time to time, wondered if he was ever going to, uh, to crack it. I think that, right deep down, he just had a very strong belief in himself. Stronger than I thought he had, actually. I kept leaving. But I realise now that he had a very strong belief in himself, yeah. So that carried him through. 
It was just a time of confusion. You don't know where you are artistically. Um, so I think leading up to Space Oddity, he had tried all these, you know, moddy, folky, you know, rocky um, areas, and, and, and it hadn't kind of taken off for him at all. I had a couple of years where I didn't do bugger all. I just, um, I moped about and um, got disenchanted and things, um, being a rock and roll star. Despite failing to set the world alight, Bowie's debut album had attracted the attention of a young musician and producer who would prove essential to his future career. Tony Visconti had recently moved to London from New York and, upon meeting Bowie, insisted that he did not give up on his ambitions. I think that when David Bowie met Tony Visconti, it's probably when, it's simply when the Beatles met George Martin that he met a person that was going to enable him to realise kind of pop visions. You know, he had a sort of, people like Visconti had a sense about how you can arrange things, how you can use a sort of studio orchestra and um, all that kind of thing. So, yes, that was certainly very, very fortuitous. Visconti is a major boon to his career and cannot be undervalued. In the 70s, Visconti was probably the most important rock producer working with T-Rex and David Bowie, obviously. And then, of course, reunited in more recent days with Heathen and Reality, Visconti tends to be the Bowie producer that Bowie fans prefer. Tony had been brought over to England to do the string arrangements for Denny Lane and his uh, electric string band. And uh, I met him as he was working in that capacity and he said, hey, um, I've started doing some producing. Well, I think what Visconti gave him was craft, you know, how to arrange songs, how to perform them, how to, how to project them. You can say what you need to say within two minutes, not 28, you know. That's what a good producer does. He, he identifies the essence of the artist and he cuts away all the ex extraneous stuff around it. Beautiful.